we're a nation of great inventors. Our science is world class and we punch above our weight. This is a report card of 16 comparable wealthy OECD nations. There are some Bs in this report card and there are 13 Ds and two Cs. And let's, let's focus in on what those main metrics are that we do well in and that we fall down on when we're trying to turn invention into innovation. So in terms of scientific articles and a, t and a quality metric for scientific articles, we are better than that already high metric that we're comparing against, these wealth generating, high standard of living OECD countries. So in the number of scientific articles per uh, normalized by population, and in the number of articles relative to our contribution that are in the top 1% of cited articles in the world, we punch above our weight. Where we fall down is when you get into these innovation and quasi-innovation metrics. So I call patents a quasi-innovation metric, or a halfway house, if you will, going from invention to innovation. Because they're an indication that you, are, you have confidence that this could have commercial value, right? And you're investing money, or somebody's investing money, saying that we think this could uh, be uh, brought into the marketplace to provide good in the economy, or good for society, or a combination thereof. And even in that metric, we get a D, both by population and normalized to the strength of our economy. Uh, there is a glimmer of hope on innovation metrics, though, in new firm density. We do create a lot of new firms compared to this high, high standard that we're comparing against. Uh, we get a B in new firm density. That's number of firms per 1,000 people created over the last five years. But what I want to point out to you tonight is that, our, well, our venture capital, we know, is low compared to these comparable countries. And it's both in the total amount of venture capital and in the size per deal, about half that of our neighbors to the south. Um, and that links right into here, this D metric that I'm going to focus in on tonight, this D metric at the bottom, that is number of patenting firms that are less than five years old. So why do we care about firms who have filed for triadic patents, that means patents in the US, in Europe, and Japan, that are less than five years old? Well, the reason we care about those is that they're a great indicator of the type of science-based firms that have an idea that is unique, that is, has world-scale significance, and that may be able to both address some big world problems and also help build the knowledge-based sector here in Canada. So you have to be, to be a firm who's filing for patents in Canada, the US, Europe, and Japan, for these triadic patents that they're measuring, you need to both have somebody who's believing in you to invest in you and the belief that you can create and capture value on a large scale. And that's an area where we really fall down. And we'll get into some of the reasons for that. So Industry Canada wanted to find out why after decades do we still keep getting this report card on innovation that's not getting better? Why do we still have a lot of Ds? Uh, in the part where we're actually commercializing products. And it turns out, they, they actually did an excellent survey. They commissioned an excellent survey in 2009. Uh, hasn't been one done since uh, of this sort of scale. But this is a survey where they asked the right questions. They asked them of the CEOs and or innovation managers of firms uh, across sectors in Canada that had more than 20 employees, and in the end, in their survey results, these are about 5,000 firms that replied, and they said their major obstacle to innovation was the perception of risk and uncertainty. Think about that. Risk and uncertainty are my major obstacle to innovation. It's kind of ironic, because without risk or uncertainty, there's no real opportunity. So this is something that we, we have to be able to both change cultural attitudes towards or train people to be able to, particularly people who could be leading these sort of ventures and leading new product development in, in, in these sort of companies that are important to our knowledge-based sector, but train people to better manage 
under environments of risk and uncertainty. So it's particularly problematic in this category that my research is about and that I'm going to talk mainly about tonight, which is science-based ventures. We talk a lot about technology ventures and the technology sector. And the way I'm using the language here is I'm differentiating technology ventures from science-based ventures. And there's, differ and there's differentiation in the literature. A science-based venture is a venture that both uh, commercializes science, but is also actively contributing back to the cutting edge of science. So they're publishing and they're patenting. And that's a, that's a science-based venture. And they have a lot of tacit knowledge. They're tightly tied to research institutions because the science is changing. And they face much longer times to commercialization. It can be on the order of 10 years instead of you know, a few months to two years in, in a typical software venture, for example. Uh, and they face much higher levels of technology uncertainty. They face high market uncertainty too, but they certainly face much higher le levels of technology uncertainty. And you can see here from this red circle, which is the amount of commercialization cost, the cost it takes to get it out of the lab and into commercially viable products is much, much higher. And so that's where the venture capital lack here compared to our comparable countries particularly constrains science-based ventures. I'm trying to distinguish between advanced materials, a type of science-based venture, uh, and uh, biomed firms, to try to distinguish what's different for them, these types of science-based ventures, than IT ventures. Think about apps development, for example, which Vancouver does wonderfully well, does wonderfully well at all sorts of, of IT innovation. Um, but think about apps development. You can develop an app maybe three months, six months. Uh, you can do it for a few hundred thousand dollars. I've polled some of my students on, on costs there, um, as well as looked at uh, more rigorous sources. So you're talking about a whole different scale. You may still have high market uncertainty, but you don't have the type of technology uncertainty that you face in science-based ventures. And you also don't have it for an extended period of time. You know, we're talking 10 years of time here, up to 15 years. You don't have the same amount of initial R&D cost, and you certainly don't have these large scale up commercialization costs. So here I'm thinking about clinical trials, and here I'm thinking about scaling up a new material, for example, into a production process first, into a pilot process, then into the full scale kind of manufacturing facility that you need in order to make an economically viable product. So it's really challenging. So you might just say, whoa, it's no wonder we don't bother with innovation in this space. Like, you know, we'll stick to invention in this space and we'll do our innovation up here. But the problem is, with that sort of a perspective, is that some of the great challenges of our country, of our world, come in this space. So, you know, we're thinking about different methods of curing cancer. If we're thinking about, um, you know, the, the impact of climate change and trying to reduce our carbon emissions. Uh, we're thinking about clean water. All of those sort of big issues, they're happening in this space. And so it's even more important, as well as the fact that you can build a very solid knowledge-based economy with good jobs in these spaces, it's also because these are some of our big complex problems which are really worth fixing. And so it's not all doom and gloom, in fact, uh, there's a lot of different approaches that we could take to impact this. And we, I could spend an evening talking about innovation policy and changes that we, as a, both as, as a country and a, as a regional system innovation, could change to help this system. Um, there's been some really good stuff about that in the Jenkins report, if, if people are familiar with it uh, and wanted to read it. Um, I could also talk about venture capital and different ways that we could... We could um, uh, work on that issue, and it's tied in with an innovation system, of course. But what I am going to talk about tonight is what scientist entrepreneurs can do in the environment that we're in to make their chances much better of getting important innovations here, out of the lab, and into the market space.